Hello, God and Glam family. And if you're new, I am Lisa Marie, and I'm so excited that you're here. We host this daily video Bible study every morning, and we walk through a seasonal reading. So all you need to get started if you're just joining us is the God and Glam Bible study, which goes through an entire calendar year and a Bible. So today we are going to be reading through John 3, 1 through 22, I believe. And this, or 1 through 21, and this is um, kind of like the most important story in the Bible, arguably. It's kind of the foundation of faith, so I'm feeling a little pressure to do this some justice. We've had some heavy hitters this week between the Sermon on the Mount, and now we're doing John 3. So, um, man, I have so much to say. It's like, where to begin, where to begin. So, um, yeah, let's begin with the word. Normally I set the scene here, but John 3... It takes place in the very beginning of Jesus's ministry, some believe, I think. Um, yeah, let's just get to it, and I'll, I'll commentate as we go. So I'm going to be switching back and forth between the message and the NIV. So I'm going to start with the message, or excuse me, I'm going to start with the NIV in chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling, ruling council. Okay, so... We talked about this before, but just to recap, Pharisees, Sadducees, these were the Instagram influencers of the day with like 300 million followers. They were literally the original influencers from a biblical perspective. These were the people who set culture. These were the people who literally influenced the people as far as what to do, what to believe, what to, like what was right, what was wrong, literally everything. So these, these people were also in charge of the written word. So kind of similar to like the world of the handmaid's tale, which we've all been living in, in the paper and glam book club, these, the biblical people of this time, they couldn't read, right? There was no formal education. They couldn't read or write. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees were the educated elite and they could read and write. So that meant they could read the word of God and their job was to interpret it back to the people. So that's really important as to keep in mind as we read the story that this is this the, that the people in biblical times counted on these people to accurately reflect the scriptures. So really similar to The Handmaid's Tale, we saw how that same thing happened, right? The people of Gilead were not able to read and write unless you were a male, and then they used all of the scriptures to like for their own purposes. So this, and that was all to retain power. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees did the exact same thing as we read in Gilead, right? They are controlling the word of God to retain power. And they aren't willing to accept that Jesus is the son of God because that's going to limit their power, right? Then they're not in control. Then they're not the ones influencing culture. Then, then they're not the ones who, you know, get to be like the, the people that everyone follows. So, verse two, he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. I love what the message says. It says, no one could do all the God pointing, God revealing acts you do if God weren't in on it. And that's such a reminder, that line, that people should look at our lives too and say, this doesn't even make sense. Like, I can't even process this unless God is in on it, right? Like, I quote this line all the time from Kanye West, but it's, um, I'm not a big Kanye fan, but I love this, this, this line. He says, um, I've been talking to God for so long, and if you look at my life, it's God's talking back. And that is exactly what we want as Christians, right? We want our life to do the speaking. We want our life to go before us, before our words, before our message. Okay, uh, verse three. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Jesus answered, oh, sorry, he is, verse four, how can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus said, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Okay, so <laughs> Jesus throws down some really crazy analogy, and Nicodemus is like, wait, what? 
Uh, <laughs> so let's break this down a little bit. And this is, this is the great mystery of the gospel. So Jesus uses birth to speak about faith. And birth is, in a lot of ways, the most common thing in the world, right? Like, you and I are all here because we were born, right? And, but at the same time, that's a great mystery, right? Like, no one exactly knows how that works. I mean, we kind of do from a scientific perspective, but like, there's no one like making it work. You know what I mean? It's like we talked about with the orange tree. Like my orange tree isn't outside being like, I need to make an orange, I need to make an orange, I need to make an orange. No, it's like, let me just take in the sun, take in stuff from the soil, and I trust the orange is gonna come, right? It's the same with birth, and it's the same with faith in God, right? We don't, like we don't power it ourselves. We trust that the power is working within us. So that is kind of what Jesus is saying here. And then Nicodemus totally doesn't get it. And so Jesus uses another analogy, and I just love this analogy. He says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And the message calls this the invisible moving the visible. And then it goes on to say, when you look at a baby, it's just that, a body you can look at and touch, but the person who doesn't, but the person who takes shape with, within is formed by something you can't see and touch. The spirit becomes a living spirit. So he's using this analogy of birth and using this analogy of the wind as the, just the most wonderful, beautiful symbol of faith, right? Like we feel the wind, we hear the wind rustling through the trees, we feel it, we feel it, we hear, we hear it like going up against our houses, right? But we can't see it and no one knows exactly how it works so is the life in Christ, right? We have to have, it's like that Hebrews quote, right? I think it's like Hebrews 5, right? Faith is, it's, um, what is it? The evidence of things hoped for but not seen, right? Like it is faith because we can't see it and we don't fully understand it. So faith like birth is the most common thing and it's also the greatest mystery. So that's what Jesus is saying here to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus says, how can this be? And Jesus says, you are Israel's teacher and you do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? And I really like the message translation. It says, um, well, back to the wind. It says, you know well enough how the wind blows this way and that. You hear it rustling through the trees, but you have no idea where it comes from or where it's headed next. And then it says, instead of, he's talking about faith here, instead of facing the evidence and accepting it, you procrastinate with questions. I tell you things that are plain as the hand before your face and you don't believe me. What use is there in telling you things you can't see, the things of God? So Jesus is basically saying to Nicodemus, like, you don't want to believe, right? You just want, you want to ask more questions. You want more proof. And so, so Nicodemus represents this faith that, or this lack of faith that we all come up against, right? That we all grapple with, that we can all recognize in ourselves and as well as the people around us, especially at a time like this, right? So we've talked about in the Bible, like anytime Jesus is talking to someone, we're always to put ourselves in that position. So we're always Nicodemus. We're always the person who's doubting. We're always the person who needs to be healed, right? So when we take our place in the story as Nicodemus, like he is representing this, this like nitpicky faith, right? That's like, well, what about that? Well, what about that? You know, that, that like wants to prove this wrong, wants to prove that Jesus isn't who he says he is, right? Wants to prove, like doesn't want it to be true, right? So like they're coming up with excuses and questions, right? I'm sure that we've all encountered that in our lives and ourselves and, and also in people around us. Okay, so um, moving to verse 13. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness. So the man, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So this here is a throwback to Numbers 21 when Moses lifts up the snake on the stick, right? And it has since then still been our sign of healing, right? And it's really interesting we're reading this today because we've all been seeing that symbol a lot right now, right? Because that's the symbol of doctors, healers, hospitals, all of that. And it was a good reminder for me today that God's still in charge, right? God's still on the throne, even if it doesn't look that way.
Okay, um, verse 16, here's the heavy hitter. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And so this goes back to what we were talking about yesterday and the day before with the Sermon on the Mount, right? Jesus didn't come to judge the world, he came to save it. So we're not here to judge the world and judge others or even judge ourselves, like we're here to redeem it. We're here to partner with God to redeem it. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they did not believe in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come on into the world, but people love darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. And this is also a throwback to everything that we read in Epiphany. The symbol of Epiphany is light, right? That whole season is about seeing the light of Christ and living in the light of Christ. So this goes back to that same concept that we talked about for for those eight weeks. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. And I love what the message translation says. First, with the heavy hitter for John 3.16, it says, Don, God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust him has long since been under the death sentence without knowing it. This is the crisis we're in. God, God's light streamed into the world, but men and women everywhere ran for the darkness. They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial and illusion, hates God's light and won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. But anyone working and living in truth and reality welcomes God's light, light so that the work can be seen for the God work it is. So I love this reminder here in the message that if we want God to work in our lives, right, then our work becomes God's work, right? It's not about us anymore. But if we don't believe in God, we don't believe he's the one controlling all the things, making the sun come up, making us wake up every day, preparing all these good deeds in advance for us to do, then we get the glory, right? Then we get the notoriety. Then it's about us. And that's what Nicodemus is symbolizing, right? He didn't want to believe because then it's not him and his like gross squad of like, influencers right it's then it's about god then it's about jesus then they fade into the background right they become less and less he becomes more and more jesus becomes more and more like we talked about yesterday so what the what the word is saying here is that like do are you willing to give god the credit right like are you willing to let god work in your life and testify that god is working in your life because then you know he gets the credit right and he's going to do infinitely more than you can ask or imagine right verse 3, Ephesians 3.20, but the deal is, like, we have to let him lead. We have to let him be like the wind. We have to let him be like, like birth. We have to let him be like springtime, right? The flowers pop up all around us, and we have no control of it. We're just there. We're just along for the ride, and that's what Jesus wants us to be, right? Along for the ride. He doesn't want us to be pushing and pulling. Don't get me wrong, right? He doesn't want us to be passive, but he wants us, our faith to be active, but trusting in him, right? Letting him lead, and that's really what I got out of um, today's reading, and I have a little more for you guys, um, but I just want to check in and see see how this is hitting you guys, see what comments are happening, check in on the recording since it froze on me a second ago <laughs> before we got started. Okay, so I really love what the Jesus Bible commentary said. It had a whole page commentary here on a new birth, so this is what the Jesus Bible looks like, and I wanted to show you guys, this is really cool. Um, it's kind of fun now that we're like getting into a different season. Like we can see like all the blue is what we did for Epiphany because blue is the color of Epiphany. And then, um, and then there's the green. So I'm just loving the way that like when we're done with this, our whole Bible is going to be covered in like blue and green and pink and orange, like depending on what season it is. And it's kind of cool to see like where we've been from a very colorful visual perspective. Okay. On to the Jesus Bible. So it says, when, with the help of the Holy Spirit, individuals see their own sin and need for a savior, and when they see Jesus for all that he is and realize how deep his sacrifice was and how deep his love is, then the believer is captured by the love and beauty of Christ. When his followers see how deeply God has loved his people in Christ, then they are all inspired by their own desire for him to surrender. Such an experience is salvation, the new birth. So the Bible is saying here that our natural reaction when we ex when we have that life-changing experience with Christ, right, 
is like, we're never the same again, right? When we encounter the love of God, we're never the same. There's a Kim Walker song um, by Jesus Culture that, that talks about this. I'll have to link it below um, it for the YouTube video and give it to you guys uh, live. But it's like, it, it, she says in the song, she's like, we're never the same, we're never the same. And I think about that, that's about like the new birth, right? Like once you've experienced the love of Christ, like there's no turning back, there's no denying it, there's no living how you lived before. And people instinctive, instinctively know that, right? That's why there's so much doubt. If you can just kind of like delay that life change, if you can just kind of delay that truth, if you can kind of just like push it out, push it out of your mind, push it to like the corners of your mind, then you don't have to change, right? And then you can just keep going business as usual. Uh, and kind of like put it off, put off that like faith, conversion to put off that new birth for for another time because as soon as we acknowledge who christ is and we're inspired by that then everything becomes about that right our lives can't help but speak to that life change speak to that new birth but that comes with great responsibility right we talked about an epiphany that every time jesus heals someone it, it came with responsibility and so it is with us as soon as we have faith in christ as soon as we believe then then we're in it right then then it's then it's not nothing's the same anymore, right? There's no turning back. That healing comes with responsibility, just like, just like a birth comes with responsibility, right? We're born into this world and like, we gotta make it, right? We gotta make our way in it. We gotta come and do the, the good deeds prepared in advance for us to do. There's no turning back after that, right? So is the life of faith. So this really beautiful story about um, Nicodemus is just like the central metaphor for uh, the gospel, right? For who Christ is and and how we experience him in our world and how we experience the life of faith, right? Like wind whistling through the trees. So um, I want to close with some incredible words from Miss Shauna. Um, oh, Cameron says she loves that song. You'll have to tell me um, what song it is. Or in a second, I'll pause the recording and look really quick so I can tell you guys what it is, but I wanted to share this incredible um, reading from Saver, the Saver devotional. This is July 17th and it's called Trusting the Wind and God and Glenn Patrons. If you're in the spreadsheet that I used to prepare this, you can follow along because I copied and pasted in there. Um, these were definitely the words I needed to hear this morning. The coronavirus has definitely gotten real for me um, in the past 24 hours and real for Paper and Glenn. So we, um, so like really quick background information of how this, this relates to Kind of what I'm going through in the last 24 hours is so we have our production center in LA and my production manager and I have become really great friends he owns our production center so he's his team is all at home but he's there kind of working business as usual so he's like don't worry I'm still gonna still gonna make all the stickers I'm like okay great so the one thing we we outsource to like a someone else is the cut on our stickers and um that's actually the most expensive piece of the process so I shared you guys that shared with you guys that what necessitated me moving home to Napa was that um, we've been working with this pet vendor for years and years, like three years, and the account manager we had, um, she left the company and we got a new account manager. And when we got a new account manager, she doubled prices on us. And we were like, oh my gosh, you can't do that. Like this, that means like people don't have jobs if you do that, you know, like can we at least have some grace? Can we compromise? They're like, no, 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 take it or leave it. So I'm like, okay. I'll cut my living expenses totally. I'll eliminate a few jobs. I have to, to keep this going. And um, so that necessitated me moving to Napa. That was in September. And we talked about this when we talked about Genesis 3, right? The reason for all pain. We talked about how we don't know what's good or bad when it happens to us because we're not God. We don't have enough perspective. So in that moment, that was really bad because obviously, like anyone getting a bill for thousands and thousands of dollars every month for into perpetuity, like, right? That's a... That's from an earthly perspective, a bad thing, but it necessitated me moving home to Napa like seconds before the coronavirus. This was like such a wink from God. So I'm so grateful to be home um, at a time like this. But anyway, so the saga continues. Yesterday, my production manager called and he was like, oh my goodness, um, Nicole was laid off. And I'm like, wait, what? He's like, yeah, I just got an auto response saying that like it was her last day. She was no longer with the company and now I can't get a hold of anyone there. So he had reached out because he was checking in on the May or the June and the June collection because they're like, when is, you know, what's the turnaround time? Like, how are we doing and all that? Um, and so, yeah, now like we, they're on the East Coast, so we cannot get a hold of them. We have no idea. And I'm just like, so panicked because I'm like, first off, we already, like we use Pink and Glam, like the team spent a ton of time, right? A ton of money, like creating these collections, like, and they're insane. They're beautiful. Like every collection is the best collection we've ever done. 
And like, I've already paid for all that. But, and now like, we might not even get them back from production. Like we have no idea. And like, if the price is up for negotiation again, like then we, we could be in trouble again, which is what they did last time. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, I like, couldn't sleep last night. Cause I was like, so like worried. This is like my income. This is my team's income. Right. Like, and this is for like months and months. And like, we've already created all the collections up through August. Right. So we can't produce them. Like that's bad. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I read this, this reading from Shauna and I was just like, Oh my God, this is exactly what I needed to hear in light of all of this. And in the past, when these things happen in business all the time, I have a million stories just like this one. And I have enough conditioning to know that God is on the front of the throne and it always works out in the end because I've been through this so many times, but that doesn't help us in the moment, right? That doesn't help us in our faith when, like when our faith is shaking, right? Um, we still just have to show up and take the shot with our hands shaking. So this is what Shauna had to say about this exact situation. I'm sure you guys have situations in your own life that are exactly like this. You don't know how it's going to turn out and your faith is really being strengthened and your faith is being test tested. So Shauna says, and this is in response to John 3, 8, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with anyone born of the spirit. Okay. I grew up on the water, spending my summers on a tiny lakeshore town in Michigan, where we ran the beaches, soaked up the sun, picked blueberries. But if there was wind, we sailed. We dropped everything. We raced down to the marina. Wind, there's wind. For a sailor, the wind is everything. If you want to be in control of what's happening, you don't sail. If you want certainty, you get a powerboat and you stick to engines instead of wind. I feel that tension in myself sometimes to trust the wind or to control with my own engine. I want to be a sailor, but in my fearful moments, I feel the impo impulse to fire up the engine, to pick a spot and head there fast, to burn some fuel instead of waiting around for the wind to do its powerful and invis invisible work. I'm learning that the wind is where it's at. When you trust the wind, when you wait for life to lead and unfold in its own timing, the feeling is exciting and calm in the very same moment. One of the best feelings in the world. And then she says, for reflection, what is your inclination to trust the wind and let life unfold or to fire up an engine and make something happen? Is there an area in your life where you need to wait for the wind? So this idea of the wind and this idea of birth just hit me like a truck this morning with what, what I'm going through with the business, right? Because like this, this, this business I've been working on since I was 17, right? Like it was born with me. And I've shared that like I, as a child had like pregnancy rumors or rumors, pregnancy fears. And I didn't even know how the birds and the bees worked. I was like, mom, I'm going to get pregnant. And she was like, you're four, you're not, you know? And, but I didn't understand how it worked. And as soon as I had like paper and glam out in the world, all of those nightmares stopped. And I always felt like I had this thing inside me. I had to get out. And you know, birthing a business is a lot like birthing a child. Not that I've done it, but like, it's like raising a child, right? Those of you, most of you guys have been with me for a long time who are on live right now and who watch this, like you've seen how the business has gone from one thing to where it is today. Right. And I, I didn't do that. Right. I just showed up for the work. I trusted that God would bring the right people. And he did at just the right time, right. To make it happen. And that's what we're called to do in the life of faith, right? You just show up for the work. You just keep showing up for the day and God decides what he's going to make of it, right? You just bring what you have and he makes something beautiful. Like it's not on me to make something beautiful. And I've shared with you guys, I'm like, what is going on? Like, it feels like everything with, with the business of paper and glam is kind of like falling apart. I've had tons of turnover on my team. And, um, then this production thing, I'm like, Oh God, uh, what's going on? And I, and a lot of people are in this position, right? These things that we have thought we built and like, we're so proud of them, like so quickly have changed. Right. And we've talked about that all week that like nothing is guaranteed. Like we think we have the security in, you know, whether that's a paycheck every two weeks or whether that's, you know, health security, or, you know, we, we think we have the security that the world is what the world is and nothing can change and everything can change right in the blink. And that's, and that's why we're all at home, right? <laughs> Things change really quickly in a blink. And um, there's no guarantees. And that's the life of faith, right? It's the wind whistling through trees. So that's what I have for you guys today. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. And if you're struggling with anything, I'd love to pray with you. And yeah, I'm going to um, read some comments. Shondalyn, I've been thinking about you. I was thinking about you this morning. I was like, man, I haven't seen Shondalyn in a hot minute. I hope she made it over to Zoom with us. 
Okay, Jen says, I have a note in my Bible that says, do I search for Jesus at night due to non-belief? Do I search for Jesus at night due to non-belief? Meaning, am I looking for him at night because I don't believe he can? Hidden and secret in the night or a faithful follower all day long? Yeah, that's a really interesting detail that is in the gospel, right? That Nicodemus came to, came to Jesus under cover of night. He didn't want anyone to know that he'd gone to see Jesus because like you don't go see someone that like you have no purpose for, right? Like you don't just seek someone out without wanting an answer, right? Without wanting something from them. Um, so yeah, he didn't want anyone to know that he had gone to see Jesus because the, like, the Pharisees were telling everyone like, that guy Jesus, right? They were all making fun of him. He was, he was like somebody you didn't want to be associated with. And he didn't want anyone to know that he was associated with Jesus or they didn't believe Jesus. And how many of us don't want other people to know that we believe this whole Jesus thing, right? Like how many times am I tempted to forget, forsake this whole Christianity thing when it doesn't seem cool, right? Because Jesus wasn't cool in Nicodemus's time and sometimes he's not very cool in our time, right? Uh, let's see, what else? Um, <laughs> Chelsea says that song, You've Gotta Have Faith by George Michaels is a beautiful song. Yes, it is. Um, Courtney says, I've heard an opinion that we focus a lot on 316, but don't focus on 17 enough. That's an interesting observation. So 17, so 16, of course, is for God to love the world. He sent his only son so we could have eternal life. And then 17 says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Yeah. So goes back to to that that second part right christianity gets a bad rap as being about like rules and being about judgment right and being about like measuring up to a certain standard of living and that's really not what jesus came for at all i really love what my commentary said about this um very story it says jesus tells a religious leader that life abundant and eternal is a gift from above and is not attained by achievement claim or proof nothing could be more appropriate for lent than a reminder that prayer and fasting do not earn anything right nothing we do earns god's love nicodemus represents a faith unclear and seeking more proofs that is based on signs to him and through him jesus declares that god loves and gives life to the world god's realm is not achieved calculated safely fixed on a faith that has been proven by signs. Rather, life is given of God as free from our control as the wind. And that's such an affirmation that like Jesus isn't here to judge, right? It's not about earning anything. And as soon as we have, <clears throat> as soon as we have judgment, then it follows that we also have a narrative of earning, right? So as soon as we judge ourselves as well, right? I'm very guilty of judging myself constantly. And if I'm doing that, then by the very definition, I'm living outside of God's grace, right? And I'm living in a spirit of judgment. So really good, really good thought, Courtney. Um, Jen says, I think 317 is rich and full of promise and hope. It should be highlighted to all Christians. Absolutely. <laughs> um, let's see, what else? Cameron says, oh yes, the wind. I wait on this with my marriage. Yeah, we're all waiting on the wind for something, right? Because that's the human condition, waiting. We're all always waiting for something, which is why the Bible has so many beautiful stories about waiting. And it's actually the only theme that we do twice in the God and Glam on Bible study is waiting. We do it in Advent and gosh, I can't remember the other time we do it, but um, yeah, that's the fundamental human experience is waiting in hope, right? Waiting in joyful expectation. The Bible says that hope is what is the fuel the, the human spirit runs on. And by very definition, if we're hoping for something, we're waiting for something. And yeah, that's another beautiful metaphor for um, the life and faith. All right, what do you guys think? Anyone wanna be brave and come on video with me this morning? <laughs> Nobody? 21 of you guys are on, that's really exciting. <laughs> oh, Leslie says more content in the moment, more content in the moment. What do you mean, Leslie? <laughs> Karen says we sailed for 18 months. The wind comes and goes, but it always comes back. And the peace when the loud engine is turned off and all you hear is the wind in the sails and the boat moving through the water is amazing. Yeah, that's a really, really beautiful metaphor too. Like when we turn our engine off, right? Like even for the day, it's like, perfect peace, right? Like when we finish the day and we can like 
I don't know, read a book or something. It's just like, oh, it's like that exhale feeling. And that should be life and faith, right? It should be that quiet. It should be that peace. It should be that deep, deep contentment, that deeply rooted contentment that is not based on circumstances, right? And that's something that I'm having to put my money where my mouth is right now. And um, I'm sure a lot of you are too. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, Leslie says more content is in response to Chelsea, which is up with you, so I missed that one. Sorry, you guys. Um, let's see, Susie says, any wind or breeze always makes me think of the Holy Spirit and the shack. It is so meaningful to me. Yeah, one of my favorite books ever is the shack. It's, um, patrons, you have a PDF in the Google Drive that has links to all of my favorite books and the shack is on there. I think the shack would be a really, really wonderful book to read in this time. If you need something encouraging or you feel like you need um, a different perspective on who God is, um, yeah, it's a book that I feel like I could read over and over and I, I just get something different out of it every time. Um, and also that wind analogy also reminds me of one of my favorite movies, A Walk to Remember. Have you guys seen that Nicholas Sparks adaptation with, Matt, um, with uh, Mandy Moore and Shane West, I think? And, and he says, like, love is like the wind. You can see it, and you can, or you can feel it, but you can't see it. Um, yeah, I just love that. Okay. No other, no other comments? If not, then um, I will wrap us up for today. Okay. So, oh, tomorrow we have a good one. So tomorrow is all about laying down our anxiety. Another timely reading, right? So this is Matthew 6, 25 through 34. And that's, we're going to go over at 8.30 a.m. Pacific, live on Zoom um, on Monday. And man, it's one of my favorite readings. So I said every month or every morning, I'm like, this is one of my favorite readings. This is such an important reading, but <laughs> I think I'm alive. So with that, you guys, um, definitely leave me comments in the replay if you're watching the replay. Um, I just feel like this, this study is just like more important and more encouraging and more timely than ever. And um, I'm really blessed to share kind of what's going on in, in my life in a way I haven't before in like real time because I know that the Lord's going to work through it just like he's going to work through whatever um, you guys are going through and one day all these things are just stories we tell right there's just everything that we go through just becomes a story we tell and that story is usually about who God is and what he's done in our life so it's just an opportunity to experience God's grace and his saving power so until next time my sweet God and glam family give this video a thumbs up on your way out and tell someone about it for me Okay, see you next time.